following talk I gave to students at Xavier University studying electrical engineering. And in fact, the students liked it so much that Xavier hired me as a professor right after. And in this talk, I go about all the different subfields in electrical engineering, career options within electrical engineering, and just everything about why electrical engineering is the best college major. Here for the first time, my name is Ali. I'm a PhD student in electrical engineering, and I've done many electrical engineering internships, including two at NASA, one at NASA Kennedy Space Center, one at NASA JPL, and I'm currently doing an internship at MIT. So I have a ton of industry experience in electrical engineering on top of like 10 published papers. And I just think electrical engineering is like the greatest thing ever. So let's just go ahead and watch it. So let's track back. Why do we study electrical engineering? Now there are maybe few options why you chose this major. Um, Maybe because it's less boring than mechanical engineering, or maybe you like math and science and you want to do something with that. And maybe you just heard that, okay, you can get a good job after you graduate with an uh, electrical engineering degree and never ever go to school again. Um, maybe you heard engineers make good money, which is <laughs> not very true in my honest opinion. And uh, maybe you have a family member who's an engineer and, and whatnot. Um, there could be different reasons. And there, there, it could be that you actually wanted to make a difference and contribute to innovation. Now, this definitely was not my, my reason going into it, but it is my reason now. Um, I definitely just wanted to just get a job and work 95, make like 80,000 a year, go home, play the guitar, play video games, and just chill and, and relax, do absolutely nothing. So that's kind of how I got into it. But it's not really much about how you got into it. Uh, because right now, um, I have something great to tell you, is that if you're an electrical engineer or studying electrical engineering, in my honest opinion, this is probably the best degree out there light years ahead of anything else you can st study in college. And the, the, reason, the reason for that is that right now, more than ever, we need more devices built. It used to be that, I don't know, 10 years ago, everyone maybe had a cell phone, um, maybe had a laptop. Now you probably have like an iPad, you have a, like a watch, you have, I don't know, people have like uh, all types of devices on their body. Soon enough, we're probably even gonna have like sensors on our own clothes telling us how cold or warm it is and we're gonna have our clothes like warm itself. So we, we need more devices than ever. And the people that build devices are electrical engineers. Another thing is crucial is that space just went commercial. Now, it used to be that only NASA, uh, Russian government, uh, Russian Space Agency, and maybe Japan, China, a few other countries had access to space. It used to be a government's game only. But now you can actually go start uh, like a space startup, apply for a license, and then go launch your own satellites to space. So because space went commercial, there's, there's a huge opportunity in space. It's probably the next trillion dollar industry. And that alone will have so much opportunity for signal processing, for antennas, for batteries and whatnot, which all require electrical engineers. Now, another important thing is that the internet is reaching remote areas. It used to be the internet when it first started was only like in, in the US and like Western Europe, then it expanded to like um, Asia, Middle East. And now it's, it's even starting to reach some of the more remote areas in Africa too. And, and part of this is private companies again. So, uh, for example, like Starlink, is trying to make something like that happen. Now, this is important because now more than ever, we're gonna be interconnected with even more people in the world. If you thought the internet was wild as it is, wait until more people join it. And that's only gonna create more opportunity. This one's my favorite, is that we are becoming cyborgs. And you may not, you may look at this and be like, okay, what's going on here? Well, we kind of already are cyborgs. As a matter of fact, your phone and your laptop are things you cannot live without right now. As a matter of fact, if I were to take away your phone right now um, and then take away one of your kidneys, um, you're probably going to want your phone more. Um, and that just tells you a lot about how dependent we are becoming on technology. It's just that right now we are using our fingers and voice and ears to interface with technology. So we're kind of um, like a very inefficient cyborg. But soon enough, with brain-machine interfaces, um, these type of things will become a reality. And I know that some people may be like, okay, I really don't want like life to go there. I'm, and to be honest, I am not really a big fan of it either, but the reality is it will happen no matter what. So if you're able to jump on top of it and be the good guy and use it for good purposes, um, I think that would be a great thing. But regardless, there is insane amount of opportunity for electrical engineers in the areas of biomedical engineering, especially with uh, interfacing with the human body. Now, this one is also great is that money is going electrical. So it used to be that um, as of now, I mean, we still use the U.S. dollar, the euro, the yen, use all th these type of currencies. Uh, but these currencies have a fundamental problem. Uh, well, two fundamental problems. One, in that they are centralized, meaning one person really decides all the rules about that type of money. And two, it is inflationary, meaning that same person can print as much of they want of that money. And therefore, that money doesn't really have value because in reality, you can just that same person or organization can just print as much money as it wants. And it's losing real value. 
Now, thankfully, smart people and creative people figured this out a long time ago. And now we have things called cryptocurrencies based on blockchain technology, such as Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, Dogecoin. You've probably heard about all these. And to be honest, there's a lot of value to them, mainly because, again, they are decentralized. And in the case of Bitcoin, for example, uh, it does not inflate. There's a fixed amount of it um, such that it retains its value. So when you start thinking about the future of finance, the future of banking, um, if you're an electrical engineer, you're probably in the right place. And just in summary, the future will be dominated by technology. If you thought more than ever, technology has been kind of overtaking our life. We, guys, we're not even, we're just getting started. Soon enough, technology will be something like the air we breathe. And again, if you're an electrical engineer, you are the person creating, designing, implementing that technology. So in other words, the future is EE, which is good for us at least. Okay, so when we start thinking about the future, I just described to you, and we want to create it. How do we create it? Well, we need electronics engineers, right? We need people to like design circuits and um, implement them, test them. We need computer engineers. We need people that build processors, RAMs, whatnot, that are really fast, that do all the computation. Um, and this kind of goes hand in hand with software engineers. Software engineers write code, but uh, computer engineers do a lot more than that. They actually deal with a lot of the hardware also or and the architecture of the processors. Uh, we need embedded systems engineers. So as I was talking, there's gonna be a lot of like wireless interconnected devices, whatnot. These are all embedded systems. Um, and they need to be um, designed and built. Uh, we need antenna engineers. And this one is extremely important because with the rise of so many wireless devices, uh, we are depending on wireless a lot more than on wired things. And for that, you need an antenna to make that electricity flying electricity. In order for the electricity to fly, it needs an antenna. So you need antenna engineers. We also need RF and microwave engineers. And these are basically the people that are kind of like electronics engineers but they are dealing with alternating currents at very high frequencies. So as you know, electronics engineers are usually dealing with like DC or like very low frequency AC, like a couple megahertz. But when I'm talking RF microwave, like it's starting to get to the terahertz, which is kind of the things that I work on. Now, also with the rise of photonics or lasers, um, there's a huge opportunity for photonics and lasers engineers and that people that are basically able to build devices that are manipulating light to serve many purposes, um, mainly, for example, for communication. As a matter of fact, NASA is starting to rely a lot more on laser as a mean of communication. Um, so this is definitely a, a, a very growing area. Uh, and telecommunications of all sorts. So again, if we wanna get a device a message from point A to point B, we gotta communicate it somehow, this falls under that. Signal processing pertains more specifically to the kind of algorithms you implement to the signals you're sending. Uh, and this can be like filtering, can be like amplifying, can be all that kind of cool stuff that go on before your signal gets detected and actually um, you, you make something out of it. Um, networking is going to be very important. For example, right now, SpaceX, Starlink is launching a ton of satellites in space. But it's probably going to be, I don't know, 12,000 satellites. And these guys need to be coordinated very well. For that, you need very good networking protocols. Um, so there's a huge opportunity for that as well. Controls engineer, as we build more automated systems, we need people that build the proper control systems for them to make sure they are good, they don't do anything crazy. Um, power engineers, obviously, as now we're going uh, renewable, like with solar and wind, um, there's insane amount of opportunity for that. Uh, fab, uh, nanoelectronics, as people that are like designing the uh, chips that have all the transistors that do all the crazy things that we're doing, microfabrication, people that actually go and build these chips, um, biomedical engineering, physicists, you get the idea, I could go on forever. And in each one of these categories, we need people who design, we need people who go out in the field to implement, we need people who test, we need people who do research, and so on. So now I just threw so much at you, and I just helped you realize, okay, the future looks a certain way, and there's, there's a way you could fit in it. There's a way you could be part of it. So now I ask you again, okay, do you have a plan? Now, are you closer to having a plan? And I want you to keep this question in your mind, and I want you to think about this. And let's make one. So if, if you don't have a plan, or if you're thinking about having a plan, let's actually go in and make one. So for example, I just threw a, a ton of options at you. Now you're a junior or a senior and you're thinking, oh, well, I probably wanna, I don't know, look into at least one of these and figure out which one it is that suits my personality better, suits my preferences, suits my intellectual curiosity. So um, what, what I would do is now that, for example, I gave you all these options and I will be attached, this will be recorded. These slides are going to be posted somewhere. So don't worry now about like writing everything down. Just kind of think.
think for a second is that uh, based on the things that I just gave you, and, and again, you're not limited to that. You can go on, on, on the internet and, and find a lot more. I want you to find a few things of value that you enjoy, or at least interested in, like some of these that may seem interesting. Um, do your research and experiment as in go Google or I don't know, use your favorite search engine and I think learn more about them, watch some YouTube videos about them, whatnot. Uh, maybe even reach out to like professors or engineers in that area uh, and then make a list. And then based on what you like and don't like, start with what you don't like. Eliminate the ones that you don't like because it's far more important that you end up with a job that you tolerate than it is with one you absolutely hate. You, you, you want to, you, the worst case scenario is you end up with a job you hate. We don't want that. Um, at best case scenario is you end up with a job you love. We want that. But like a good place to start is somewhere where you don't mind or, or you like, okay, maybe you wake up and it's not like the most exciting thing in the morning, but you still, you're not hating yourself for doing it. That's the key. So that's why it's important to get rid of what you don't like first before you focus on what you like. Okay. Once you do that over and over, repeat. Okay. And now this will help you kind of figure out what's going on, how you feel um, about how you want to be part of that future. And again, take, take the time to do this. Um, and, and again, you could do this like after you go home or whatnot. Just think for a second. Think think about how the future looks like and think about how you want to be part of it. And then based on that, go and look at the options and then perform this exercise and so on. Okay, so now that you've figured out what to do or at least eliminated most of the things you don't want to do, how do you get good at that one thing that um, you became really good at? Well, again, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, one, you want to use fun ways to learn it. So there's a reason why I work on space and lasers and brain machine interfaces is because I have a personal rule of that. If something is boring, I don't work on it. Now, obviously, that is a luxury of a rule. And in order for me to do that, I have to be really good at it, which is step number two. Now, in order for me to really like what I do, um, I need to be really good at it. Why? Because if I'm not good at it and if I'm not feeling competent, I'm not going to want to I'm not going to want people to ask me about it. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be excited to talk about it. Um, and if I, if, if I pick a topic and I'm really interested in it and I dive into it and, and I, I gather all this information and I cannot wear, wait to share it with the world, I'm going to be a lot more enthusiastic about it. And, and these kind of things go hand in hand. If you're using fun ways to learn it and you're good at it, that's usually a good combination. Now, another way of using fun way to learning it is, um, for example, I took a communication systems class and um, all that math just flew over my head. I just could not deal with the four-year series and the four-year transform and, and, and all that. And I, I don't know, I would just look at it and be like, okay, what is going on? And then what I started doing is I realized that in music production, there's actually a lot of signal processing. And while I did not like the signal processing in the textbook, I was definitely interested in the signal processing going on to make music. Um, so what I started doing is I downloaded a software called Ableton and I started playing around with making electronic music. And I started learning, okay, what does an amplifier do in this case? What does a filter do? How do you actually filter out these frequencies? What is phase? Uh, what is compression? And when I learned all these things in the context of music, and then I went back and learned, like went and looked at it in terms of how my textbook was explaining it, all of a sudden I understood it a lot better because I used a fun way to understand the medium. So there's a challenge for you. Whenever you, there's something you want to learn, but you're just eh, not really getting it, Ask yourself if there's a more fun application that you could use to actually grab it. Now, number three, this is extremely important. Find like-minded people. And, and this for me was huge because again, when I was a freshman in college, uh, I, let's track back. When I was in senior year in high school, um, I dropped out of honors physics because it was too hard and I did not want to do these like long assignments. And I realized that in high school and most of early undergrad, most of my friends were not people who liked to study. Most of my friends were people who um, just kind of focused on, I don't know, like playing sports or just watching movies or just kind of chilling, doing nothing, which nothing is wrong with that. I, I think you still need that kind of people in your life to have some leisure. But um, my undergrad experience really changed a lot when I forced myself to go and find more like-minded people. People are more curious, people who want to learn more. And I did that through joining clubs. I did that from, to talking to uh, random people in classes and just kind of ask people they're curious about, hey, what are you working on? What kind of things going on? Oh, and, and then someone's like, oh, I'm working on this, I'm in this club, do you want to join? Or even if they don't ask, I'll be like, oh, can I come with you to that thing? And so on. Um, it is very important to find like-minded people when you want to figure out what, what it is you want to do, because it's just a lot more efficient to learn and it makes learning a lot more fun. And then last but not least is you want to teach it to other people. Whatever you do, you want to be so good at knowing it that you can teach it to other people like they're five years old. Now, if you pick any of the topics that I research, 
I can explain it to you like you're five years old and you would understand it. Why is that? And is, that is because of a combination of things. I really like it. I'm really good at it and whatnot. And I've tried to teach it previously. And it is because I try to teach it. I'm able to find gaps in my knowledge. And, and you probably have gone through this. You try to explain something to someone and you're like, dude, actually, I don't know. Like, I don't know how that thing works. But the second you say, I don't know how that specific part works is great because you have just identified the certain part that you need to go and learn to make the big picture continue. So if you really want to test whether you know something or not, teach it to someone else and even better explain it to them like they're five years old. Okay, so now you've figured out an area you want to, uh, I don't know, pursue or, or be part of. Uh, if you figured out how to like be really good at it and now you probably want to get an internship in that in that area because you want to figure out Okay, is this for me? Is this not one way to find out? Let's go to the industry and actually do it. And first, you want to understand why you should get an internship. And an internship is extremely important. You should try to get one. Now, it's not the end of the world if you don't get one before you graduate. But if you're able to get one, it makes life so much easier. Because in an internship, one, you are in industry. You get to see how engineers uh, behave in the real world, how managers interact, how projects get done. You, you Well, hopefully, you're getting paid. And uh, that feels nice as you actually start realizing, okay, because in undergrad, there's this concept is that like once you graduate and start having a paycheck, like life will just become butterflies, which may or may not be the case. But being able to simulate that in three months is very important. So you should try your best to get an internship. Now, in order to get an internship, um, you need uh, a recruiter to notice you. And in order for a recruiter to notice you, you need a killer resume and you need in order to have an amazing resume need to build good skills and in order to get good skills you need to get involved in projects and, and clubs and whatnot um very common thing i used to tell myself when i was an undergrad is oh i don't have an internship so i can't get an internship because most recruiters look at interns with previous internship experience and that is partially true but if you're able to if you're able to demonstrate that you showcase uh that you did something similar to an internship such that again in a project um, and like a club that you did and like some leadership role, uh, if you're able to showcase that and talk about it, um, that really attracts recruiters. For example, I did not have an internship, but I spent like two years um, working at this CubeSat lab in my uh, university where I learned everything. And that was just a student ran club. It was nothing really special. But based on that, the recruiters were very interested in, in what I was talking about. Now, again, a, a little tip on your resume, make it very brief, straight to the point, not too complicated, not too crowded with words. Remember that a recruiter only has about 30 seconds to look at your resume. If within 30 seconds, they don't find anything interesting, they're probably just going to toss it up and you'll, you'll never <laughs> hear back from them again. So uh, in your resume, you want to highlight the things that you have worked on. If you don't have that much experience and you have room, you could also even include like an objective or like a statement um, to say, hey, this is why I am. This is what I'm interested in. I want this internship or whatnot. Uh, but again, this step is very crucial. Um, and again, to have a good resume, you need the good experience. No other way to find uh, to fight around that. Now, once you have a good resume and you want to apply for an internship, uh, you want to first apply online. For example, go to your favorite company if you want to go work. I don't know, uh, Tesla. Go to Tesla Careers and look what kind of opportunities they have and apply online. But don't stop there. Applying online, I, I don't want to give a percentage, but a big percentage of the time is not very useful because so many people apply online. You want to increase the odds of getting noticed. So you want to do other things in order to get noticed. In other words, you want to do other things such as make a LinkedIn account and you can go Google my name and, and for example, see that my LinkedIn account um, is very, very well detailed, well documented. And um, I actually use it even as my resume in most cases. Um, it's, it, LinkedIn is becoming very, very, powerful. Uh, there's also Indeed, which I really like. And that in case if you are going to go apply online, you can apply directly on the website of the company you're interested in. But I, I also would suggest that you would go on to Indeed, upload your resume. And you should probably upload it like again every two weeks because they do have an algorithm that checks for the most recent submissions. So you want to constantly make sure your stuff is up to date maybe every two weeks during the time where you're like actively applying and maybe like once every month or a few months when you're not actively applying. And the last thing is you want to follow up on your applications. Again, so let's say you applied online, you went on LinkedIn, you reached out to some people, you submitted the application, and even maybe you even did an interview. You want to follow up, find the person who interviewed you, send them an email, say, hey, this was really nice talking to you. Um, I was just curious. Like, um, some, you, and, and this is up to you. You could be like, I'm curious. When do you think I'm going to hear back? Or you could say something along the lines of, 
I'm curious, like, what kind of things do you think I can work on to prepare in case I do land the opportunity? And, and, the, and it doesn't really matter what you say as much as it is that you're showing that you're interested enough to go out of your way to send an email to say, hey, thank you for taking the time to interview me. Um, I'm very interested, in other words, okay? Okay, so now that you got an internship, or again, maybe you didn't, and you are looking at your job offers, okay? So you're, you're trying to figure out what kind of job you want to get. You have to consider a few things. I mean, obviously, you want to consider salary, uh, your company size, location, vacation time, if they have development programs, if they can pay for your master's degree. But most important, the people you work with. And I cannot emphasize this enough, but the people you work with is like 95% of the equation and everything else in here is only 5%. And the reason for that is because the people you work with will literally dictate your day-to-day -day mood and your day-to-day -day performance. If you're working with people that you like and are enthusiastic about the projects to the extent that you are, um, life will be easy because then you, you, you'll likely go on about your work and, and do it very happily regardless of how much you're getting paid or regardless of, for example, how much time off you're getting. And, and, and on the other hand, if you, if you have a job that's very high paying and um, has a nice location, all that, but you absolutely hate the people you work with, you're gonna, you're, none of that money will matter. No, 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 nothing else will matter. You're going to wake up every day and you're going to think, okay, uh, I don't really want to go to work. Is there any, anything else I can do? So uh, now, now you might ask, okay, what are some ways I can find out if I like the people I work with? The, the people that interview you, don't think that the interview is just the recruiter asking you questions. As a matter of fact, you should be asking questions, more questions afterwards. Ask about the company culture. Ask about what do you guys do like for fun? Um, how do people interact with each other? Um, ask about like support programs. I'd be like, okay, if I'm really like having a rough day, what kind of things does your company offer? Um, ask about these kind of things and, and try to get to know the people on a personal level. And if, if there are people you like and could get along with, I think that is great news. If it's people that like are either terribly boring or just they look, I don't know, like very condescending people, I probably wouldn't want to work with these people unless I had like absolutely no option. So that's definitely something uh, important to consider. Now, the last thing is right now, some of you are probably thinking, okay, should I go to grad school? Maybe, maybe not. Now, in my case, I did go to grad school, and I'll talk about this for a second. So you need to ask yourself, do you enjoy the university environment, or can you not wait to be done? And, like, can you handle additional few years of being broke, or do you need to make money urgently, even if it's not going to be a lot of money? And um, also, do you think you're ready for the workforce, or do you think you could use more time in school to kind of, uh, I don't know, prepare? Now, once you ask yourself these questions, which are kind of more like um, career oriented, I want you to go ahead and ask yourself the following questions. And again, you don't have to worry about writing these down. I, we will have these slides um, published somewhere. Um, is there any area you would like in your major that you could specialize in and, and that you think, okay, maybe I could get a job here too, but I'm actually really curious about the science behind this. And maybe I wanna see what research is going on in that area. Um, and likewise, is there a certain professor you found who does fascinating research? You go on their page, and you, and, and I remember, for example, when I was uh, when I was a freshman, I, I I I had a portal in my university where it would list all the all the professors and the kind of work they're doing. And there was this professor who was working on, like uh, I don't know, like uh, putting lasers inside the brain and and using new types of uh, communication and space and and all that crazy stuff and basically through trying to learn more about that person, um, I got really interested in this idea of research. And I realized, okay, industry is a lot more hands-on most of the time. They do have R&D divisions, uh, although they make you work like hell. But usually a university environment is good if you want to expand your knowledge beyond just what is going on that is applicable. Um, usually you work on more futuristic things in graduate school. So you want to find out the professor who's doing these things because in graduate school, uh, especially in a PhD, your work will entirely depend on the work that the professor you're working with is doing. So for example, if you choose a professor who's working on like biomedical antennas, your PhD topic will be related to biomedical antennas and so forth. And then lastly, is there something you have not accomplished in undergrad that you wish to do in grad school? And, and for me, actually, a part of the reason why I went to grad school, I know it's gonna, it's gonna sound ridiculous, is that I really wanted to do study abroad in my undergrad and I couldn't. Um, because I did like back-to-back -back internships and I just ran out of time. And at the time, my school was offering the first ever study abroad program for graduate students. And to me, that obviously was not the only reason, but that just kind of made the reason a lot easier is that, okay, maybe I'll do like a master's uh, for like a year or two and then get out, go to industry. 
Um, but then I was like, okay, you know what? I actually like this. Um, and then I applied for the PhD program. Okay, and then two more things I want to emphasize is regardless of anything you want to do, you want to kind of optimize how you go about things. Um, now, I couldn't find a better, I, I hate to use this, this phrase, but the simple way to put it is how to become smarter. And the reality is, okay, we get it. You're smart, I'm smart, everyone's smart, but everyone can become a lot smarter. And the way I look at smart as a word, my definition of it is just someone who's like more efficient at learning, someone who's more efficient at understanding complicated topics. And again, these are not things we are necessarily born with. Again, speaking from personal experience, um, I was not, I would not consider myself smart at all. But again, through a lot of brute force iteration and talking to people, learning things, um, I found ways to learn how to become smarter. Uh, and the first one is improve your soft skills. And it may be a shocker that this is the most important thing on my list, but think about it. So there's, then there's you, and then there's the world full of knowledge, including people, books, whatnot. How do you go and grab that knowledge? You have to be really good at communication. You have to be really good at first knowing what you want, then asking for what you want, and then like um, communicating with other people efficiently. And as a matter of fact, as of, as of right now, you're probably noticing, you're like, oh my God, wow, this guy can talk all day. And the reason for that is because I developed these skills over time, mainly from talking to so many people and asking so many people questions. Because if you have very poor soft skills, which again, you can improve, you can read books on it, you can go talk to people. There's The internet has a lot of free content on how to improve your soft skills. Without that, you're not going to be efficient in learning, period. You're not going to be good at asking other people questions. And, and if you're not able to do that, if you're not able to extract knowledge out of other people, you're, you're going to fall behind very quickly. Now, this kind of goes in hand, hand in hand with, with point number two, is that you want to hang out with smart people. Uh, it is no surprise that the people you hang out with and the people you talk to will have a huge influence on the kind of thoughts you have, the kind of discussions you have. Um, so again, I'm not saying go ditch your party friends. Like if your friends just kind of like to chill and play video games or not, that's fine. I have friends that are like that too. And I enjoy spending time with them because again, it's leisure. I don't want to constantly be stressed and thinking, but I would say that again, my undergrad experience changed a lot when I started hanging out uh, around people much smarter than me. As a matter of fact, the ideal case, and for example, this is how I felt when I went to uh, JPL, the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, is I treated it as an apprenticeship, where I'm an apprentice, I'm someone who's going to learn, and everyone else is smarter than me. I am the least smart or capable person in the room, but I'm willing to work really hard to change that. And that's the ideal case, is you're surrounded by people who are more intellectually capable than you, but through work and through learning and asking the right question, you're able to at least get on their level. That's really the ideal case. That's the most efficient way to learn. Now, one more thing is use social media wisely. Now, I know I'm guilty of this. I do have like an Instagram, Twitter, why not? Like I, I do spend some time on social media, especially since I do a lot of traveling. I lived in different countries. So I do like to keep up with my friends all over the world. And um, the reality is if you, wake, if you wake up and you check like your Instagram very first thing in the morning, you already lost the day. You know, if you wake up in this reactive state where you're just kind of uh, reacting to what's going on and, and, and that's it, you're already screwed. Your body has released enough dopamine that even sitting on your laptop and doing your homework is not appealing enough. So you want to use social media very wisely. Again, this is not really the core of this presentation, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but figure out what distraction sources are kind of limiting you from reaching your potential and make plans to address that. I would highly encourage that. Now, one more thing is you can read. Um, as a matter of fact, right behind me here, you can see all these books. I actually only started reading about a year and a half ago. Before then, I had not read a single book in my life um, simply because I hated it. But because I got really interested in learning, I started reading. And I started reading many types of books. Um, something I would recommend is read autobiographies. Find people who you are interested in, uh, in, in being like or people you are learning from, you want to learn from, and read um, from their autobiographies. Um, another types of books, there's a lot of like self-development books where books kind of tell you how to like manage your time, how to uh, take care of certain things, how to control your emotions better. I really like these books. And then um, I think also like reading fiction helps a lot um, because you want to constantly expand your imagination. And um, I just want to check how we're doing on time. And how, how much time do we have until? It's like four o'clock, right? Uh, 3.50 is the end of the session. Um, but we want to leave like five minutes room for Q&A. Okay, cool. 
All right, so I'm just going to race through a lot of these things um, simply because I spent more time going in detail. Um, finally, you want to find mentors. Again, you can get those through books or you can go and talk to people in real life. It's very important to ask people for help. Um, so again, kind of to summarize what I just told you, did I have a plan? Uh, yes, I had a plan. And that's kind of the reason why I was able to get my things together. And that um, my freshman year, I wanted to figure out what I want to do with my life. And then I figured out what kind of major I want to do. And then I went and talked to people, attended things. Sophomore year, okay, I wanted to figure out what in engineering I want to do. And then did kind of the same thing, attend events, but why not to ask people, ask professors, shadow engineers, figured it out. My junior year, I wanted to get an internship. So first I wanted to make a good resume. I went and I got the experience. I did all uh, the things I could do to get noticed. And because I wanted to intern at NASA, for example, I went and I worked on a CubeSat or space related project. My senior year, um, I wanted to decide between my job and my grad school. So I spent a lot of time thinking about industry. Uh, I found professors who I might want to work with. I asked them questions. I got involved in research and then I decided on it. Uh, in grad school, I wanted to choose a topic. In my second year, I wanted to prioritize my personal life over my work. So I did more of that. That's also when I really got into music. Um, and then lastly, in my third year, I wanted to make bigger impact on the world beyond just my research and beyond just what I'm doing as an engineer. And for that, again, I, I found people who are doing that. And so with how they do it, uh, I asked myself, what skills do I have? How can I share it with the world? Uh, I wrote a book to help other people and probably might even make like a YouTube channel where I can just make like short videos on teaching people these little things that I know. Uh, and this is also something that is very important in that um, the mindset I want you guys to take away is that the world is becoming tougher. It's becoming very difficult. Life is becoming harder. That's okay. Uh, instead of telling yourself things are getting more competitive, so I shouldn't bother, you should tell yourself things are getting more competitive, but that's okay. So I should gain better skills. You should always be in the mindset of, okay, there will always be competition. Things will always get harder. Instead of kind of complaining about that, the only way out is to actually get better. Uh, and, and, and lastly, do what others are not doing. Expand your imagination. Uh, for example, I love science fiction. Uh, I think like, for example, these two books, uh, one of them is about space. One of them is this idea that people are lost in a maze and there's mechanical objects floating around. Uh, these kind of books really expand my imagination, make me think about really creative solutions that I apply in my personal professional life. Uh, I really like movies. Um, I highly recommend you guys find quality movies and watch them again, because especially movies that challenge your thoughts, make you think more deeply about life. Uh, I would highly recommend that. And then just have faith that the dots will connect. This is something Steve Jobs used to always say is that the dots can only connect when you look backwards, not forward. So just go on about what you're doing, Divor divorce the results from the, prod uh, from, uh, from the progress and just kind of keep going at it. And the dots will probably connect. So now that you have heard this, I hope you're able to take away that you should have a plan. And, and, and maybe you should ask yourself in a few days or weeks or month, uh, months, do you have a plan? I should be able to follow it. And that's it. Thank you very much. You have questions? Ali, thank you very much. That was excellent and very motivating. Right. Uh, Thank you so much. Any questions, guys? Yes, we'll yeah. start with Renzo. I was wondering, is there any certifications that we should pursue before graduation? Is there any what? I'm sorry? Certifications. Um, okay, so I come from the school of thought that you don't even need a college degree if you have the skills. Uh, so to be honest, focus more on getting skills, whether it's like programming languages or like circuit design or something that is like tangible and useful. Uh, if, if you're able to focus more on that, um, I think companies, especially the more innovative companies, find that a lot more valuable. Uh, for example, if like when I hire people to work for me, whether it's through research or through a project, um, I sure I, I, I take a look at their resume. But then I, I first thing I ask them, ask them, like, what's the most difficult problem you have solved? Um, what 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 it is that you have worked on? Can you tell me how cool projects you have worked on? I, I find that to be a lot more valuable. Other questions? Right. So as I was saying, um, do you think that the job market's going to be looking more for people that have book skills, you know, with the new technology coming out, or should it be more in-place experience as we talk, you know, the next 10 to 15 years? Um, I, I think the job market will be in demand of people who can build things. Um, and again, whether it be like software or like design or um, even integration testing, um, so any any type of design or hands-on skill 
will be in demand, uh, in my opinion. And yes, obviously, you need to expand your knowledge. You need to keep up with what's going on. Um, but as, as long as you have skills that someone can take and put to good use, and make sure your skills are not like, like a, a robot immune. Uh, and, and a robot prone, I'm sorry, like, like make sure the skills that you're working on will not be replaced by a robot. In other words, for example, if you're like a truck driver, um, it's probably not a good job, like for the next 30 years, probably will be replaced by a robot. But if you're like a software developer or like, uh, I don't know, maybe an antenna designer, that's something that requires more human like creativity. Um, so, so ideally you want to find a job that is like technical, but has like a little bit of an artistic element too, which I mean, robots really suck at being artistic. Um, so yeah, and guys, if you don't, if you have questions but you're tired or like you're eh, you're, um, you don't, we're running out of time. Uh, I do have my email address here. If you want, you can write this down. And um, if you're, if you can, in return of this, I only ask of you if you're able to send me an email and tell me what is your plan going forward. Um, what kind of things you want to have in that plan? Uh, two, what did you enjoy most out of this talk? What can be improved? Just kind of some feedback. Um, on this conversation that we that we had and then finally like what it is something you want to tell me or ask me okay so because we're running out of time we can always take that conversation elsewhere so uh, definitely feel free to reach out uh, for this email and I will be giving these slides to Dr. Rudd so he can uh, distribute it to you guys uh, as he pleases you could also find the recording okay